Good afternoon, and thank you very much. Um, as was mentioned, this is a session that's dealing with carrying and passing the baton. So within that context, um, we are going to have the panelists share some valuable insights as it relates to being a mentor as well as a mentee. And so we have some prescribed questions that we're going to be, uh, that I'll be raising to each of the panelists, giving them an opportunity to uh, share with you their responses. And of course, we'll have time at the end of the session to open the floor for questions. So with that being said, our first question will be, uh, why are mentor mentorship programs important? And we'll start with our first panelist, Patricia. Okay, well, there are so many reasons, and uh, I'm sure we'll be sharing some perspectives here. Uh, one that comes to mind is organizations need to stay agile in learning. Um, being in the energy industry, something that I have noticed through the years, is we are an industry that appreciates technical depth. And uh, we tend to uh, seek to have all the experience, all the knowledge, all the answers. But the world changes tremendously uh, from technology, business, context. And we need to stay agile in learning. And that learning comes from many, many directions. Um, something that I'm seeing in my uh, experience right now as an entrepreneur is that I have this multi-generation and um, work environment. So one of the things that we try to focus on is not just in mentoring, but co-mentoring. Uh, co so that means I try to pass some of my experience, but at the same time, I try to stay open to my team, who is much younger than me, to mentor me as well, and to mentor the more experienced uh, people. That way, uh, we try to bridge the generational gap we try to complement each other with expertise and perspectives. And we try to move from being the person that has all the answers to be the people that are always in the seek for new knowledge and new learning. Katie? So I really look at the data. And the data says that women do not get access to opportunities and mentorship as much as their male counterparts there is a huge gap, an 80-20 gap. And for women of color, it's absolutely abysmal. It's 64%. 64% of women of color do not have access to advice that helps advance them in their careers, get the promotions they deserve, and obviously progress society, because that's what all of you and all of us are here to do. So if you look at the data, um, I think it's pretty telling, and we need to make sure that we put mentoring not as a priority in our organizations, but make it a value. Excellent. Thank you. Jennifer? It, so I would say there's there's mentorship and there's sponsorship, right? And I feel like we, we, we talk about this a lot in uh, various women's uh, networking events across the industry. And I, and I think that mentorship programs it sort of goes without saying that there's there's this great sort of um, uh, opportunity to, to have access to sounding boards, to development from a sort of a one-to-one -one context of having someone who you can truly look up to and, and use as a as a partner in, in sort of shaping your thinking about your career and, and again, just sounding board for what is going to happen next in, uh, in your path as you're thinking through those decisions. But the sponsorship piece of that is equally important, um, and I find... You know, we, as a firm, work with a lot of different um, women's networks around the country in the energy sector. Um, and the piece that I, again, go back to again and again is saying, but make sure that there's something tangible that comes from this where it is about supporting each other to getting to that next state step and actually having a, an opportunity to to uh, advance your career through the connections that you make by having sponsors who will lobby for you and help you get to that next point. Um, and so I think we all need to be mindful of having both of those things and, and the path that we follow and looking for those in the networks that we form with the mentors that we seek out um, because they're, they're two different roles so they can be one and the same and you wanna make sure you're kind of getting access to both. And Jessica? Is it on? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to echo a little bit of a theme I'm hearing today, which is, to me, mentoring is about accelerating the speed of change. 
And so I was thinking about if we all had to start from square one and we didn't have the benefit of others to teach us along the way, we wouldn't be able to make as much progress in our important clean energy initiatives. Um, just a quick plug for Southern California Edison. Uh, we just released our pathway to 2045 to reach 100% clean energy. And it's an ambitious plan with ambitious goals. And we are also looking at what is the future skill sets and the workforce that we're going to need to reach those goals. And it's going to include people like data scientists and cybersecurity specialists and much more. So when I think about mentoring, I think we have the collective power to move faster together and not be in competition with one another, but be collaborative and, and kind of build that network and, and move us along quicker. So they've kind of shared with you from a more general, broad perspective. Um, in terms of mentoring and, and the importance of it. So if we could uh, get a little bit more personable and share with the audience, how have mentoring helped you uh, from your early years up until the position you're holding right now? And uh, we'll start with you, Jessica. Yeah, um, I wanna appreciate what Katie said about women of color. And when I started off in the workforce, I was able to really benefit from a mentoring program um, called the Advertising Training Program. And it was actually called the Minority Advertising Training Program. And I guess the word minority is not as popular as it was back then. Um, but it really did give me that access and set me on the path in my career. And I was really appreciative of that program because if it wasn't for that program, I wouldn't have gotten into those really large advertising agencies. Um, I would say more recently at Edison, we've got about 15 decentralized groups of different mentoring flavors. And so I've gotten just a lot of fortunate abilities to learn um, from topics like how do you brand yourself? How do you network? Um, and also, what is it like to be a female board member at um, Edison International? So just getting a sneak peek into all of that has been very fortunate. And I think that now, being uh, where I'm at in my career and thinking back, I'm wanting to give more back to the community. So I'm a mentor for the Association of Women in Energy and Environment and really been enjoying that role too. Thank you. So I, much like almost everyone in this room, um, I have spent my career uh, largely in the energy sector and um, was often the only woman that was a part of the team, that was a part of, you know, sitting at the table. Uh, and and I, people pointed this out a few times today. I, I never really found that to be something that made me feel disadvantaged in a way. I, I often found that it was something that you sort of stood out because people had to remember you. You were the only woman sitting at the table. And so um, I, I think through that as well, what I found was in the early days of my career, there, there were people who gravitated towards me, and I, and I didn't even realize the olive branch was being extended that they were offering to sort of mentor and, and be that gut check for me um, and helping me sort of navigate the different pathways that were available to me. And, and I've been in uh, sort of banking and consulting and a different kind of consulting now at Russell Reynolds, and so always generally in a professional services domain, always crazy pacing, lots of client demands, things like that. And having people who from a very early start helped me figure out how do you balance the, the sort of the, the external and the client work that you're doing with your own professional development and making sure that you're, you're giving yourself the opportunity to continue to grow within the organization and positioning yourselves in the right way to, to do that was really important to me because I was sort of heads down, like just trying to do great work for my clients all the time and I kept having people pull me back and say, but wait, you really need to be a part of this thought leadership or you need to be out front and doing this at this conference or you need to be in this way. And you know what, some of that was just because I was the woman and they were sort of like, great, we need to have a woman like out there representing us at this conference along with our you know, entourage of men. Um, but it, it worked really in my favor and it was one of those things where I, I kind of didn't even know it was happening at the time in a much more concerted way since coming into our firm, um, which we, we do executive search and leadership consulting at Russell Reynolds, um, it, we have a very sort of set apprenticeship program for, for how people come into this business. Um, and, uh, and I was incredibly fortunate that my, my mentor and truly my sponsor um, at the firm was the founder of our power and utilities practice, which I now lead today. And the firm brought me in behind him, hoping that a transition would go very well as he geared towards his own retirement. Um, and he took me under his wing, was completely um, 
I think, accessible on sort of every level that, that I personally needed. Not a warm and fuzzy kind of guy, by the way. Like, we mostly talked about sports and everything happened in a sports analogy and there's a lot of things that I really <laughs> didn't care about but found a way to connect with him on and, and, and he knew that and so we, we sort of had like an interesting like uh, counterbalance on how, how, we, how we related to each other but um, it, was, uh, it was something that just absolutely helped to position me, make me better at my job and, and really helped me to see kind of the right pathway forward for assuming a, a practice leadership role from him. So in that sense, um, you know, I would say it's what got me to where I am today, certainly within my own professional path. Um, beyond that, I would tell you that uh, kind of giving back then becomes in the DNA of, of our firm. We have set mentorship programs. We literally have rigorous sponsorship programs within the firm um, that uh, if, if done right and executed well, hopefully position others for success and feeling like they've got a great path forward. So it's something that's sort of a, a virtuous cycle um, with the firm that I work for. Outside of it, I get to be a part of an incredible range of, of women's networks for women in energy and get to develop relationships with women that are starting their careers through organizations like C3E up to women who are transitioning to board service and sort of moving out of full-time roles uh, and um, like to think that I, I get to be a good sounding board for them and sort of paying that back in an external way. Thank you. Katie? So it took me 10 years to figure it out. Um, my first job, I was laid off. It was pretty awful. I didn't have a mentor. Um, my second job looks a little bit like my first job. I got laid off again. Uh, and then I became a consultant, uh, very young in my career. And, and my father, I remember, called me and said, could you just put your feet in the ground and get a job, right? And it took a while. I, I read books, and you got to understand, I, so I graduated in 97, I know, for some of the millennials in the room. We didn't have iPads, and we didn't have LinkedIn, and right? I'm dating myself. But the point is, is that books were my, my source of inspiration, right? Because I didn't see anyone around me that looked like me. So I had to find mentorship through other channels. Uh, then I got fired. I promise I only got fired once. Um, and I highly recommend that if you can get fired, it's the best way to get your butt kicked because it is truly a learning opportunity because you learn a lot about yourself through the experiences. So in that first 10 years, I was lost as a soul. Smarter than smart, had loads of energy, but I didn't know I needed to get a mentor. I read books, I asked questions over and over, I got dinged on performance reviews. And then I joined a company called Shell. And it was my first real corporate job. And it's great, because actually there's a woman in the room who happens to be, she doesn't realize it, but she was really kind of my first mentor. And I'll never forget it, Peggy Montana, this awesome lady doing these great things. You know, everybody was talking about her. I came up to her and I said, you know, she, she was in the business. And I said, I, you know, I work in the IT organization and I'm supporting this project, Cost to Serve, a project for her organization. She took one look at me and she said, well, good luck with that one. And I thought to myself, I am going to show this woman what I can do, right? And she doesn't know about that outside world that I come from, because a lot of corporate, corporate women for a long time, right, in corporations, you know, they weren't getting active in boards, right? So we started mentoring each other. She started teaching me about the corporate world and how to navigate mother shell, right? Because that's big, big, big oil and gas and utilities, it sounds like, and clean tech. So it's big, right? So I learned from her and she learned from me, right? And then I realized that we kind of mentor at scale. If I can't find somebody like me, I gotta find a way to get everybody aware of who the mentors are, who the mentees are, and let's start knowledge sharing. So the first thing I do, did is I created Pink Petro. I must have gotten, I mean, when I first left corporate after many years at Shell and at BP and started my own business, so many reach outs. Can I have coffee with you? Can I have coffee with you? Can I have coffee with you? And I would be like, 
Yes, yes, yes. At some point, 24 hours of coffee, <laughs> and, and trust me, I am full of energy, do not want 24 hours of coffee in Katie and mentoring. So I realized we gotta find a way to connect people and get them to share their experiences. So we launched a community to connect women in energy. And so we did that, that was five years ago. And then that wasn't enough for me. Because getting those women you know, to recognize who they are and start putting names and faces and you know, helping to connect people, we decided to, to take it a step further. And a couple of years back, we partnered with Lean In and launched Lean In Energy as a nonprofit. And the CEO and president of Lean In Energy is here in the room today. You heard from her earlier in the last panel. And Lean In Energy uses technology to connect. It's kind of like the e-harmony of of mentoring, right? It, it connects people to find people. And we do that on a global scale. I think we have something like a thousand or so, fo yeah, a thousand people, like a thousand people. So, you know, for me, my journey's been a little different. I read books, I try to seek out uh, people that are different to me. And I think technology is a great way to speed up this rate of change we're talking about. Because at the end of the day, people are counting on all of us to take us into the future. And it means we've got to learn from each other and identify those mentors and mentees and do that in a way at scale. Thank you. Good. OK, well, uh, so maybe a little bit of a different perspective. I'm a petroleum engineer, and I graduated in Colombia, South America, a country that doesn't have a huge um, oil and gas industry. Now it's larger, but it wasn't at large back in the day. And uh, I never planned to start my career in field operations, but that was the opportunity that came out. And just as we uh, hear a couple of times when opportunity comes, just grab it and make the most of it. I was very lucky to start with companies like BP and Schlumberger, but it wasn't the kind of job that I had wished or planned for. Uh, these were field operations jobs. And I remember when I joined BP, I went through the same training program for a drilling engineer that uh, they use in the North Sea. And I remember receiving my uh, mentorship and, and training program, and that, that included things like being a roughneck and a derrick man. And, um, and I said, oh, this is really cool. So I'm going to the field, and I'm going to see what these people do. I said, no, you're going to do it. Uh, what are you talking about? Like, I'm a woman. So soon I recognized that some of these bias was my own bias. I had preconditioned myself that I didn't have the physical strength to do this kind of work. And good news, it happened really early in my career because I learned that I was completely wrong and I found a strength I didn't know I had. And once I discovered that, that was very, very empowering because you start wondering what else is there that I don't even know. And that, that, was, that kind of set me for whatever is thrown at me, I'm going to try. At least I'm going to try. I might fail. I might be terrible at it, but I'm going to try. Um, so I'll, I will encourage that, because uh, when I graduated from college, uh, it wasn't very common for women to be petroleum engineers. In fact, it was four of us that started the career, and then only me who graduated. And I graduated married and with a baby, which wasn't very popular. And at the time, the mentorship that I received from my male professors was, go home and cook for your husband. You have no career. Uh, so sometimes, even when you don't find the fostering, encouraging environment, you have to, uh, and I'm going through different stories with intention, because some, yeah, sometimes you will find the mentors, and I have found incredible mentors. I have been so lucky and so privileged through my career, but I also had times in which that was the kind of mentorship that I would receive. Go and just, just be a wife, just be a mother. Uh, there's no place for you here. So, so there will be moments in which you will find, as Katie say, maybe through books, through your own resilience, um, just your hard head to you know, just carry it through for things that you believe. Uh, then moving forward, I'm immigrated into the US. I'm a Latin, and some of you that know me, I'm all huggy and kissy and touchy. And, uh, and sometimes you need those 
uh, mentors, and, and again, I have had incredible bosses through my career, but as I reflect about the ones that have been so crucial in certain critical pivotal times in my life, immigrating to the US was a big deal. And, and I have this boss that all he had was high school. And, and of course, I'm an engineer, and I have my master's degree, and I have worked for these fancy companies. But he calls me to his office, and I know he cares about me. And he's all red, and he doesn't know how to say this. And I remember he extends his arms, and he says, what is this? I say, I don't know, a helicopter? <laughs> uh, I say, no, that's called personal space. And that's very important here in the US. And I know you don't do it with good intention. And most people enjoy that you're hugging and kissing and all that. But some people might be uncomfortable with those kind of things. And you need to learn to read it and to respect it. And then, you know, after you build a relationship, that's when you start, if you feel people are welcoming those kind of things. So again, I, I, that, that was incredible. And I remember I left his office and I went to a bathroom and I cried and I came back to my house and I was so offended. Uh, and I told my husband, oh, I can't believe. Uh, but then up to this day, I think I, that's one of the biggest, uh, greatest pieces of advice that I receive. Now again, moving forward um, to these most recent days, um, I home office. I have an empty nester, I have a big house, uh, and I'm now in an entrepreneurial mode. So for me, spending money in an office didn't make sense. So we home office in our um, kitchen table. And, and again, I'm big into this co-mentoring idea in which our interns and our young employees are also mentors. And, uh, and I was inviting them to mentor me. But, but I always feel there's this intimidation for them to come and teach me or correct me or guide me. And, uh, or one with the other. So, so I think for those things to work, you need to uh, show people that you're willing to show your own weaknesses or vulnerabilities. And one of the most recent experiences was with me trying to learn to code in Python, which I have never done in my life. And, and then the guys, or the ladies rather, that were data scientists and have this experience guide me and show them that I was clueless and that I was lost. And they were giving the instructions and you know some of the other younger um, interns, they were picking up so quick. And for me, it took three, four times to explain me, but I was serious. I was determined to get this thing figured out. Uh, so I think it's, it's all those different situations, right? From, from people that are mentors to you in ways that they're trying to shut you down, but then through that experience, they're teaching you something, to the ones that encourage you and recognize that you might completely be blindsided to cultural aspects, to the ones that just need to be the encouragement to be the mentor they have the potential to be for you. So I have gone through all of those experiences and I'm equally grateful for all of them. That's excellent, I, I appreciate that. Um, it, it appears that uh, all of you have, in many ways, um, grown from your experiences tremendously and have kind of played it forward in terms of giving back. Um, let's go to the point where you were truly just a mentee. Can you think back and share with uh, some of the, um, an opportunity, as well as uh, maybe um, uh, some um, aspects to what that was like as a mentee. Wow. I think I have been a very difficult mentee. <laughs> 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 no, I, um, look, I, I, I honestly believe it is in the end, and, and this is just uh, I might be wrong, but I just think you, you seek people, you want to ask questions, you want to seek advice, uh, but at the end of the day, you're responsible for your career. And, and I have the experience being a mentee uh, with one of my mentors, and I admire him tremendously. Uh, and one day he said, I don't want to be your mentor anymore. He said, why is that? Like, well, because you don't do anything I tell you to do. <laughs> I say, well, yes, because you give me ideas, those are great ideas, those work for you, but then when I think about me, that's not what I want to do. And, and in the end, if I do what you say and know what I want to do and what my heart is telling me, I'm the one that lives with the responsibilities. Uh, so that's why I was kind of laughing because I kind of have 
a little bit of a strong personality uh, and end up doing things my, my own way. But I think that's, that's important both for mentees and for mentors. Yeah, you seek advice, of course you respect, you, you learn, but at the end of the day, never try to put it in, in the other person's hand at their responsibility uh, for what they uh, recommend, right? Or what their perspective is. So that, that has been a little bit of my, my experience. Katie? So a very recent experience I had not too long ago was with my staff. Um, and I think as the CEO of a firm or as leader of a team, you absolutely have to listen to what your people say. And you've got to give them the opportunity to mentor you. And that means really listening to what they have to say, taking it in, thinking about how that can make you better um, and a stronger leader. Uh, we go further together than we do fast alone, right? And, and I think sometimes as an entrepreneur, we feel like we're alone because uh, it is a very lonely spot. I'm looking at you with admiration because um, we were both corporate women. But back to that whole type A thing, because you kind of brought it up, so I'm going to make fun of you too on that. I'm, I'm the same way. Anybody in here a type A, like it a certain way? Come on, ladies. You're at an empowerment conference. <laughs> Guys. Come on. All right. We had a guy. Um, I think sometimes we think we always have to have it the answer. And a more personal example where I had to step back and learn to ask and receive help was when I lost my house and my business to the Hurricane Harvey um, debacle in Houston. And I have to tell you, it was a humbling experience. My father taught me that you own your, you own your path. You don't ask for money. You don't ask for help. You're strong. And let me tell you something. There's something about being in a boat with your kid with nothing on your back but your cell phone, and you realize, guess what? I need some help. And I need to listen to people. And I need to be okay when someone says, hey, I'm gonna come pick you up and you can come stay at my house. Or, hey, I'm gonna send you some money. Or, hey, you know, I gotta tell you, it's hard when you are a type A and you are always on and you're expected, you're this big, larger than life person, everybody thinks you have the answers. I'm here to tell you that every single person in this room has strengths, but there are moments when you are vulnerable and it is okay. And we have to accept as humans that asking and being able to receive help is a really important part of the process. So those are kind of some recent examples. Excellent, excellent. Jennifer? Jennifer? Well, I, like, I like that uh, Patricia gave an example of someone who was maybe the, the inadvertent mentor who kind of like was more of, if we can call it tough love, but probably wasn't even coming from that sort of place. Because I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, that I have learned is really important in this world is you know, I spend all, all day long, all I do is talk to people and get to know them and get to know what makes them tick as leaders and, and understand sort of the path that they followed and the why and the how behind it. Um, and you really start to hear the, the um, just multiple permutations through which people have that, that aperture through which they view the world, right? I mean, it just everyone has a different lens. Everyone is born of different experiences, has followed a certain path, and has come down to, to where they are today for a variety of reasons that you probably don't even fully relate to or understand on any level as you're, as you're having this conversation with them. But you're, you're kind of picking and pulling it apart, and you're going, okay, like, I... I'm thinking I get what makes you work as a human being, but probably just at a surface level. And so one of the things that the the, the sort of all day long um, interactions with people has taught me is that you really need to make sure you're surrounding yourself with people who don't look and sound like you to, to get feedback from. Um, that you're seeking out people who have come from different places, uh, come from different professional paths, come from different educational upbringings, um, to, to understand sort of what their guidance would be and what, what critiques, quite frankly, they might give you about um, your own style, your own leadership, your own professional choices. Um, and, and I do this sort of in a, in a way in my own professional path by the fact that I, I get to be 
pretty fortunate and, and sort of cherry pick a bit and, and know that there are people out there that are telling me things in conversations that I fundamentally disagree with or wouldn't have done the same thing um, and actually get to go back to those people time and again and say, what would you do in this situation as, as you're dealing with this you know, team member problem or otherwise that I feel like I can kind of glean from them a different vantage point on the world. Um, and honestly, a lot of times people don't even know they're playing that role for me, but it's, it's just one of those natural offshoots of the relationships that we get to form and the, and the job that I have. But the thing that we've sort of deployed as a firm in a, in a very um, unstructured way that I personally like to utilize with all of the, the candidates that we place into new CEO roles especially is to say, form a council of advisors around you, sort of form your cabinet, if you will. Um, have your go-tos from within the industry that you can use as a sounding board. Have your go-tos from uh, totally different places that will be that safe space for you to get some feedback from. Um, ideally, have someone on your board who can also be a bit of a sounding board to you and a gut check for you that's very familiar with the internal operations of your organization. And just make sure you're surrounded with diversity of opinion and, and a range of perspectives to, to sort of shape and push you in a different way than you might naturally push yourself. Um, and and I, I try and do that again, in a very unstructured and, and informal way in my own life, because I think if we're giving that advice out to people and we're helping them set up those networks and helping them deploy that, I, I think you gotta kind of practice what you preach, right? So um, I, I, I don't mind it when someone makes me feel bad about myself because you're going to take something from that. Um, and I think you have to be willing to, to hear what you don't wanna hear. Um, and that, those are some of the, the, the things that have shaped me most um, in, in my role and in my path. Jessica. Uh, yeah, so I'll share from my experience when I um, was a mentee, I kind of thought that I had to do it right and I had to impress my mentor and had to be really, real prepared and sound really smart. And um, I think now I've learned that um, being a mentee is really a luxurious thing because you could totally be vulnerable and you know this is a safe space with your mentor and you can get the most out of that relationship if you are that trusting and that open um, so you know my mentors have helped me a lot in the past to really kind of challenge my own assumptions um, some of the things we talked about today like imposter syndrome um, i think one of the common sort of criticisms and i think maybe you can all relate that we are sometimes our own worst critic and so I'll think to myself, well, I'm not ready for that yet. You know, surely there are other people more qualified. Or um, the more recent one is, well, I'm not technical enough, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be successful. So my mentors have always helped me along those moments of doubt, and they've given me some practical suggestions and, and help. Um, one of the mentors, as I remembered, I, I was new to the solar market. Uh, I, this was my job, and um, i just gotten a new boss who was super fantastic. And so she said, well, why don't you create a cheat sheet and just start putting these factoids down and it could be your go-to place so that eventually you start building your knowledge base. So it's like a little step like that that's super helpful and empowering. Um, I had another mentor who was brutally honest with me and, and which was great, you know, and talking about having people surround, surrounding yourself with diversity. If I only went to go and talk to people who looked like me and talked like me, I wouldn't have gotten this advice, which was, um, and I was sitting in this person's office and she looked at me and she said, you know, what you're wearing right now, that's what I would wear on the weekend. So um, you need to step up your game and you know, your tone of voice, you need to talk louder. And so it's like those simple adjustments that really helped me. And these may come across as like superficial things. Oh, that's silly. Like I can wear whatever I want. I'm gonna own myself. But um, you know, I, I can't just focus on how much I know. It's also about how I come across. And you know, people make perceptions, and I don't want to limit the impact that I can make or limit my credibility if I can just you know tune up the volume of my voice just a little bit more, or if I kind of take care of the package that I'm presenting and how I show up. Um, so being a mentee, you get as much out of it as in terms of how much you put in and how much you're willing to be vulnerable and how much you're willing to be honest with your mentor. You don't need to impress them. Thank you. Um, Katie, you brought up the fact that um, technology is really helping to shape e-mentoring. Um, but there are still um, folks who would like the one-on-one. -on -one. So um, with that um, 
as a lead in, can you ladies speak to um, how you see the e-mentoring uh, evolving as well as the face-to-face -face and how those two can be complementary to one another if someone desire to seek mentoring? Do you want me to start? Mm -hmm. Please. So I think, I think, I think e-electronics are great and they're also crack because I see you all looking down at them except when I'm talking when we're all talking right but I mean the point is is like too much of one of, of one thing is a bad thing like you know too much carbon is bad right but we all live great lives or too much of you know social media or too much of, it's a balance but I think more than ever if I had LinkedIn if I had any of these tools 20 years ago I sure as heck probably wouldn't have gotten fired I probably would have gotten laid off a few times because that's kind of common right now, right? But I think about it, you have to use the technology to your advantage. They're tools. They do not replace human interaction. Homo sapiens are a cultural and social species. We are like ants in a big ant pile, right? We want to be near each other. We want that connection, and women do too. But if you travel, or maybe you don't travel, and you do the, the Zoom, you know, I've, I've learned so much from millennials and my own daughter, who's a Gen Z, who watches YouTube. I don't get that, right? I don't watch TV at all. I think there's a lot that we can learn from technology, but I can tell you right now, there are people that I haven't met, but we connected online. And it's pretty special when you do connect in person, right? So we can use that technology to keep up, and we can use that technology to help find us the right match, right? But it's incumbent on us as humans to have real conversations. I prefer the face-to-face, -face, but I think that tech is cool because it's changing the pace of our work and life, and we should leverage that to help us in, in terms of progressing the energy agenda and, and the work that you all are doing by connecting with each other. We would have never come together, this group of people, the different networks that are out there. I mean, just in the last year alone, between Carol, um, between Valentini, a C3E group, groups all over the world are starting to connect because we know we exist, right? We didn't have that before. Jennifer? I'm not the person to ask this question because I like literally go off on tirades about how social media is ruining the world all the time to my husband. So um, <laughs> I, I would it's very true, just, very I, true. Like, I, look, I, I would say everything that Katie just talked about is about connecting. It isn't so much about mentoring, and and I just think that the biggest thing that I would tell anyone in this room is you know utilize every network you can to make a connection, and then hopefully to at some point have that evolve into something that is more meaningful than simply that, a, you know, a, a friend request or a LinkedIn request or whatever it might be. Um, I mean, the way that the world is interconnected today is a phenomenal thing sometimes. And in other ways, I think it gives us a false sense of security and comfort that like we have somehow, like we have a network when it's fairly superficial. So you, you have to make those person to person connections that might never involve meeting live it might never involve doing anything more than exchanging emails from somebody but like actually ask yourself how you're using that network because i might have i don't even i couldn't even tell you how many linkedin connections that i have but how many of those people do i actually know and how many people do i actually have a real relationship with um that that's that's the thing that matters and the other thing that is and Every woman in this room, I'm sure, already knows this, but like the, the tendency with social media is to gravitate towards towards those who link, who look and think and feel and talk like you, because it's comfortable and it it's just what we do um, naturally. I think as human beings, so making sure that you are seeking out those different views and bringing people into your network from a different place, um, different paths in their careers, whatever it might be, but just make sure you're not just gravity gravitating towards affinity groups, but really towards places where you can grow. Jessica. Um, I don't really have anything much more to add, just that I think that it's another um, tool in your tool belt to have a diversity of options, whether it's online, offline, or something in between. So I say yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Patricia. Well, I think both for mentoring and, and the way how I'm approaching mentoring and technology uh, these days is really from the um, 
um, Joe posting and, and candidate preselection and interview and selection process. One of the things I, I noticed, and my company only has one year, but this is the second year that we do uh, our summer internship program. So last year we posted for the first time, we posted it in LinkedIn, and it was amazing. In, in two days, I have 350 applicants from all over the US. Uh, so I didn't have, I, I have trouble selecting the four uh, that we ended up um, um, hiring, but not really with, with applications. Through that process, because it, they were very technical positions at the time, data science, et cetera, I noticed that women tend to be more shy and less braggadocious in terms of their accomplishments, uh, both in the resumes and in the interview process. So when we came to the short list, all were men. And I have to push my advisors, my technical advisors, to say, no, I'm not going to sit down to make a selection unless we have half and half candidates. So we're going to go back and talk again to the women that better impress us. And if they're not telling us the story, we're going to ask them the questions. Um, and, and as we did that, then we ended up hiring two and two two uh, men and two female, and I was very intentional about that. A at the time, I wasn't as savvy because I wasn't um, using, for example, video conference. It was all uh, remote, and, and coincidentally, none of the uh, candidates were from Houston. Uh, and even if I had candidates from Houston, I didn't want to interview some in person and some on the phone because I felt that they will, it will give a different advantage for the ones that were interviewed in, in person. So this year we did all video conference. We knew how to ask the questions intentionally. So even if the resume looked very uh, kind of mm, mild, we knew there, were, there was a lot, of my, a lot of might behind those applicants. And we ended up bringing uh, four women, uh, five women and one man. <laughs> No discrimination against the men, but the women were amazing. So, uh, so and, and then what I also learned through the process, because we, we never had this question, where are you married or do you have kids or those kind of things during the interview process. Some of them were married and, and had kids. So we have to start being flexible in terms of, for example, some of the people working with us were in Austin. And I see how they're struggling coming to Houston from Monday through Friday to work and say, OK, you know what? This kind of work you can do from Austin and we'll connect and if we need you, you can come. And so kind of, uh, so I think those are the kind of things, again, technology, video conference, uh, to kind of gauge uh, people's body language, whether they're feeling intimidated, how do you encourage them, you know, to, uh, come on, tell me a story. I know you have done this. What have you accomplished? What have you learned? Um, and then the other one is, is really balancing and being more flexible. I, I do believe there is, there is a way. It's, it's not always easy or straightforward, but I think technology allows for all of this. Thank you. Uh, as we wrap up, we'll give each uh, panelist about uh, 30 seconds to uh, provide some uh, suggestions to the audience um, in regards to um, mentorship, mentoring, um, just whatever you feel you would like to convey to them to help uh, these young ladies as they enter the uh, clean energy career paths. Jessica, we'll start with you down there. Oh uh, gosh, I would just say to um, make the most of every opportunity and interactions, just like you're all meeting each other today. And you know, we've used this phrase a lot, but lean in <laughs> and participate. I think that you'll be surprised just in terms of the relationships that you'll make. Um, and the, the growth that you will uh, feel after that. So I would say um, just to connect with each other, you know, we can't do this alone. We're a part of a community. And that's what I would say in 30 seconds. Thank you. Jennifer? Biggest thing I would just say is look for substance in the, the network that you build. And, and whether it's looking for mentors, hopefully, again, finding truly meaningful sponsors for your career, um, but certainly in these broader social networks, making sure that you're looking for some substance in that connection that you have that's going to endure beyond today that takes you forward and, and that really is a, a value add to your career. You've taken time out of all of your busy schedules to be here. Many of you are active in various C3 networking events throughout the year, which is phenomenal, but there does need to be something that is more than just a day that comes out of what you're investing your time in here. Katie? 
So three rock star women once said, one, know yourself, be yourself, you cannot Photoshop personality, <laughs> two, hook up with a great partner, whoever that is, make sure that that's a very supportive person, and three, know your worth and add tax. <laughs> Patricia? Very good. Um, well, I mean, and I don't want to be repetitive. Um, so just thinking about something else. And we, we heard it a couple of times about kindness and empathy and humanity. Uh, and I think that is something that we need to really um, emphasize and, and don't lose sight of it. As we have all this conversation about technologies and energy transition, et cetera, let's not lose side of what is really important in the end. We really want to use technology to improve people's quality of life in the different dimensions. And, and I'm really moved with the different uh, presentations and all the different discussions that we have today, but I think that's something that we need to see as important and as much as I believe as, uh, as uh, Katie mentioned a moment ago, not just as a cherry on the top, but really at the core. Thank you very much. Let's uh, give our panelists a round of applause. And they've done an excellent job in sharing with uh, Karen and passing the baton. Uh, we thank you, and we'll turn the program back over to you, Batalino.